Bibles, Acts chapter 2, young people can be dismissed at this time. We're picking up our series, the book of Acts, the gospel proclaimed. And we are still looking at the day of Pentecost, a miraculous and wonderful day that it was. And we're going to pick up where we left off in verse 14. Acts chapter 2, verse 14 going to be reading all the way through verse 41, a little bit of a lengthy passage of scripture, but I want us to get the whole sermon here and the, the result. Just to remind you what happened, uh, God performed a miracle in these earlier verse, verses. The Holy Spirit came in a new and special way on the people there. They were able to preach and speak in languages they had never learned before. And of course, there was a sound of a rushing wind, uh, Tongues of fire above their head. This was a special, unique event here where God performed miracles and the church began. And as this is happening or is concluded, uh, the apostle Peter stands up and preaches this wonderful message. So let's pick up in verse 14. It says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you. And hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose. See it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days saith God. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens. I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by the miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourself also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by the wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it is not possible that he should be holden of it. Holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, For he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you. Of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, Whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted. And having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. He has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens. But he saith himself the Lord said unto my Lord. Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made That same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, 
saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what a miraculous event this was. Lord, there's a lot here in this sermon, and Lord, there's a lot to preach and a lot to think about, but Lord, help us not get distracted from the main truths that you have for us this morning. The truths that really are encompassed in the gospel message, the good news of salvation. Lord, as we meditate on these truths, do a work in hearts this morning, Lord. Help me as I preach, but Lord, I can't, I can't do a work in hearts, only you can do that. So I pray that you would, by your Holy Spirit, work in hearts this morning. I ask this in your Son's name. Amen. Well, we're still in the day of Pentecost here, and just to remind you, I won't re-preach my sermon from last week, but the day of Pentecost was a Jewish celebration of harvest. And this day of Pentecost, God gave a new harvest by bringing 3,000 people to salvation through these miracles and this bold gospel message. Did you notice who preached this? It said the Apostle Peter. Let me just remind you that Apostle Peter was the one who denied the Lord, we saw in the book of Mark, who denied the Lord three times in the Lord's lowest moments, went out and wept bitterly. But I'm thankful that God restored Peter encouraged him and used him in ministry. And here at the beginning of the church, it is the apostle Peter who stands up and preaches boldly the gospel message. I want to remind you, this crowd is full of foreigners, but these are foreigners that are Jews. They've come in to celebrate the uh, day of Pentecost. And so this message was focused on helping Jews to understand the good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. The result here of this bold message of these miracles of God working is that 3,000, about 3,000 people were saved. What an awesome day. Can you imagine? I mean, we've got maybe not quite 100 people here. Imagine 3,000 people coming to faith in Christ. What a glorious day this was for the gospel. I want to spend some time this morning in this message that Peter preached. And if you're taking notes, I want us to see four characteristics of the true gospel message. Four characteristics of the true gospel message. It is a sad truth this morning that there are many churches meeting, even right now, who say that they are all about the gospel. They talk about the gospel. They use the word gospel. And yet if you sit in that church and you listen to the preaching, you will never hear about hell. You will never hear about sin. You will never hear about repentance. Let me just say this morning, when we say we use the word gospel and we try to preach the gospel, that word gospel simply means good news. When we preach the good news, it's my desire that Calvary Baptist Church preach the true biblical gospel. I do not want us to wander away. It's easy to be tempted to water things down so that we can fill more pews, we can fill more coffers, more people will like to hear our preaching. It's, there's a temptation to water things down. And this morning, I want us to see the true gospel message, and I want us as a church, and I want us as individual believers to be faithful to the true gospel message. So let's look this morning at four characteristics of the true gospel message. Number one, I want us to see... It is clear about who Jesus is. It is clear about who Jesus is. This first section we're not going to spend because we don't have the time this morning to go through in verses 14 through 36. You're welcome to do it here. But the Apostle Peter is preaching and he's specifically focusing to these Jews about who Jesus was. Was. I'll just quickly uh, summarize the verses. And, and what he's doing here, because he's speaking to Jews, is he keeps quoting the Old Testament. Because remember, they would have believed and accepted the Old Testament. So Peter is using the Old Testament to communicate that Jesus was the Messiah. 
In verses 20, uh, 17 through 21, he quotes Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, in which Joel predicted the miracles that happened on this day of Pentecost. In verses 25 through 28, Peter quotes Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, and he quotes that to argue that Jesus' resurrection was predicted and prophesied in the Old Testament. In verses 34 through 35, Peter quotes Psalm 110, verse 1, to prove that Jesus' ascension into heaven was predicted by the Old Testament. So Peter spent a lot of time here wanting them to understand and believe that Jesus was this. Don't miss this. Jesus was who he said he was. And what is that? That he was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah, that he was the Savior of the world. And let me tell you something this morning. You, we're kind of sheltered here in, in this Baptist church in Quincy, Michigan, but all around the internet, all around the world, all around our country, there is false teaching about who Jesus was. There are a lot of people that say he was a good teacher. He was a revolutionary. He was a prophet. He was a good guy that was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Jesus was just this... This guy that taught peace and love. How many of you ever heard somebody say that? Jesus just taught peace and love. Let me tell you something. They never read their Bibles. There are people who claim to be preaching the gospel, but that's what they're saying about Jesus, and that is false. Jesus was the Son of God. He was the Messiah. He was the Lamb of God. He was the Savior of the world. He's the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And let me tell you something this morning. Without understanding who Jesus is, there is no good news. There is no gospel. There are people who believe in Jesus, but they deny the resurrection. They're, they're not saved. There's people who believe in Jesus, but they believe that he was a prophet. They're not just a prophet. They're not saved. There's people who believe that Jesus was a created being, that he was Satan's brother. Millions of people in our country think Jesus was Satan's brother. They're not saved. The gospel is dependent on us understanding and believing who Jesus is. And let me be clear this morning. If you do not believe that Jesus is the virgin-born Son of God who died on the cross and bodily rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, you do not understand the true gospel. You are not saved. And any message that leaves out who Jesus is and what he did is a false gospel. So let's make sure as Christians, when we're witnessing, when we're teaching in Sunday school, when we're preaching, everything we do here, that we're clear about who Jesus is and what he did. Let's look at the second thing this morning, the second characteristic of the gospel. Number two, it is confrontational. It is confrontational. Look at verse 36 with me. The apostle Peter says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Woo! Peter's not pulling any punches this morning, is he? Peter says to him, the Jesus that you crucified, he is Lord and God. Peter is bold here. Do you sense that? He is bold. This is not exactly a warm and fuzzy choice of words to make everybody love Peter. It is confrontational. And I tell you this morning, I say this often, but the gospel message is inherently offensive. Do you know why that is? Because the gospel message is you're a sinner, and if you don't repent, you are going to die and go to hell. That's offensive. There's no way to say that in a way that is not offensive. Now, now, Ephesians chapter 4 says we need to speak the truth in love, right? So I believe we need to witness and share the gospel in a loving way. But it doesn't matter how gentle I am, if I say you're a sinner going to hell, it's offensive. If I pulled you aside today, I'm not going to do this to any of you, so don't worry. But if I pulled some of you aside after the service and I said, I'll just 
pick somebody out. I'll use Andrew because he's thick-skinned. If I said, Andrew Bixler, I need to talk to you. I've been getting complaints that your breath really stinks. Okay? I really need you to brush your teeth or use a mint. You're really pushing people away from the church. Now, that would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? I don't care how lovingly I say that. I could butter him up for an hour and then drop that bomb on him. It's embarrassing. Now, that's not true. Andrew has wonderful breath. But it doesn't matter how I, it doesn't matter how I gift wrap that message. That's embarrassing. That's awkward. And that's going to hurt somebody's pride. I've had to do things like that. And you do. You want, to, you want to cushion it as much as you can and be loving. But the nature of the information is offensive. That is the way the gospel is, Christians. And what happens is Christians try to soften the offensiveness of the gospel. And they water down the message and they don't share the gospel. I don't want to offend anyone But I do want to share the true gospel. And the gospel is, you are a sinner on your way to hell if you do not repent and place your faith in Jesus Christ. So what do we do because of this offensive nature? The temptation is to water it down. But the proper response is to embrace it. To say the gospel is offensive and realize that and believe it, but to obviously present it in a loving manner, but embrace the fact that it's offensive. And this is what we have to be willing to do. We have to be willing to love people enough to offend them. If you walked in this church today and you had a big booger on your nose, and you walked by and nobody says anything, And finally, somebody walks up to you and says, hey, I'm really sorry. But you might want to wipe your nose. you got something on your nose. That's awkward, isn't it? How many of you ever done that? Been at work and you had a... uh, You don't want to raise your hand. That's okay. I know you all have. I know you all have done that. And you think this thought to yourself. Why didn't... I talked to like 20 people. Why didn't anybody tell me? You know why? They don't love you. They say, that's so awkward. Not my booger, not my problem. (laughs) Don't they? Don't we do that? Oh, I don't want to say nothing. That's so uncomfortable. That's so uncomfortable. But the person that comes up to you and tells you something you don't want to hear and says something they don't want to say, they love you. Folks, it's the same way with the gospel. If you're here today and you're not saved, you are headed to hell. And I love you enough to tell you that you're a sinner. And as Christians, if we are going to proclaim the gospel message, we have to love people enough to embrace the fact that we have to be offensive. That we have to say the hard things. The gospel message is inherently offensive. Let's look at the third thing this morning. Number three. The gospel demands a response. The gospel demands a response. Look at verse 37 and 38 with me. It says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gospel message demands a response. There's three things we see here. We see faith, repentance, and obedience, specifically obedience of baptism. You say, I don't see faith in here. But in verse 37, it says, when they were pricked at their hearts, the indication there is that when Peter described who Jesus was, they believed it. Look look over at verse 44. It says, and all they that believed were together and had all things in common. So first they believe the message. I believe who Jesus is, that he's virgin born, that he was the son of God, that he died on the cross for my sins. He rose again the third day and that he's alive and he's in heaven. You have to have dependent faith in that truth first and then repentance. People avoid this whole repentance thing. 
But it's clearly in the Bible. True saving faith is a repentant faith. What is repentance? Repentance means that we, we acknowledge our sin is an offense to God. And we say to ourselves, I do not want to offend God. I don't want to sin like that anymore. I want to live and submit to God and live for God. It is a change of mind. It's a change of direction. Before you're saved, you are living for yourself. And when you get saved, you are living for Christ. That's repentance. But it takes humility to say, I'm a sinner and I need to change. That's almost a swear word in many of your lives. The C word, change. Repentance is saying, God, I need to change. And I will change for you. That's repentance. And then we see that he encourages baptism here. Obedience. Baptism is a great first step of obedience. To say, I am saved. I repented of my sin. My faith is in Christ. And now I want to do what? I want to make my faith public. For many people, baptism is a wonderful experience. For our brothers and sisters in Christ in China, in Iran, and North Korea, baptism means losing their family, possibly losing their job and their income, possibly losing their lives. And yet, people in all those countries are getting baptized and making their faith public because they want to be obedient to Christ. That's a first step of obedience. And so if the gospel message is delivered clearly, it demands that people respond in dependent faith, repentance, and then after that, seeking a life of obedience, which should begin with baptism. My dad shared a story with me. I've heard this story many times. When my dad was very young, his Mom took him to church, him and his sister, and they were faithful. And this is in Florida. This is in the South. And churches are a little different down there. I don't know if any of you have been to a church in the South, but they're different. Baptist church in the South. And my grandmother faithfully attended and brought her children. And she was trying to get her husband, my grandfather Noah, to come. And he had no interest in it. He worked seven days a week. And so finally, he took a day off work and came to church. And he was at church, and my grandmother was thrilled. My father was thrilled. And at the invitation time came, a deacon stood up and grabbed my grandfather by the arm and started pulling him down the aisle. My grandfather and this deacon had a little tug of war in the aisle for a minute. And finally, my grandfather pulled his arm away and the deacon gave up and walked away. My grandfather was extremely mad and embarrassed and he did not go back to church for many, many years. I'm thankful he later got saved. He later got back in church. Praise God. Let me tell you, that's not how we operate here. I am not going to, I am partly because of my whole life hearing this story. I am not going to come to your pew and grab you. I am not going to pull you down to the altar. I'm not going to corner you in the back. And yet, I am burdened about some of you. I don't know your spiritual condition. I've never heard from your lips on whether you're saved or not. And I'm not going to force you into anything, but I'm, I'm burdened and I'm concerned for you. I care about your soul. I try my best to faithfully preach the word of God and to preach the gospel, but some of you, I don't know where you're at. And again, I'm not going to force you to do anything. But I am calling you this morning. The gospel message demands a response. And here's my fear. I would hate to preach in such a way that lost people can sit in this room comfortable week after week after week. If you are here and you're not saved, please, today, respond to the gospel message. Verse 37 says, they were pricked in their heart. I can't see your heart. But if the Holy Spirit is pricking you about getting saved, do it today. If the Holy Spirit is pricking you about obedience of, of baptism or obedience of joining the church or obedience of, of giving up a sin in your life, whatever it is, do it today. 
If you're not saved, you're here. I'm so glad every one of you are here. But if you're not truly saved, being here today is not going to help you. You're headed for hell. You need to get saved. So let me just encourage you. Whatever barrier it is that's keeping you from getting right with God, break that barrier today. And that, myself and our church, we would love to walk with you and to help you. But don't stay lost. And don't stay Christian, backslidden Christian. Don't stay in a place of disobedience. Respond as these people respond this day. The gospel demands a response. Let's look at the fourth and final thing this morning. Number four. It is available for every person. Let's read verse 39. Apostle Peter said, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we've talked about this the last two re- weeks. The fact that the gospel message is for every person in every nation everywhere. This is really the theme of the book. Is not just the gospel proclaimed, but the pro- gospel proclaimed to all people. I'm so thankful for that. I'm thankful that salvation is not an exclusive country club. Or a VIP organization. The message is for everyone. It is effective for anyone. Look at verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. The message is here for anyone who will gladly receive it and respond in repentance and faith. As a church, may we never have a gospel message that excludes anyone. I don't know if you've been noticing, if you're in Coldwater, but our city of Coldwater, of course, we're Quincy, but, you know, I think we kind of, you know, we're we're torn between the two here. Uh, Coldwater has become a very multicultural city. Go to Walmart sometime. Every tongue in every nation is in Walmart and Coldwater. And can I tell you something this morning? The gospel is for every one of them. This is not a white church. This is a church. Every, any person is welcome to come here and receive the gospel. It's for everybody. And if it's for everybody, that means it's for you too. No matter what. Your past, no matter what your skin color, no matter what your allergies, no matter what your attitude, the gospel is for you. The message is for you. This is the true gospel that we read this morning. It is clear about who Jesus is. It is confrontational. It demands a response and it's available for every person. This is the gospel we proclaim today. That Jesus is God, that he died for your sins, he rose again, he ascended to heaven. He is alive, he's on the right hand of God, and if you'll humble yourself, you'll repent of your sins, and you'll place your faith in Jesus Christ alone, you will be saved. I hope you're saved today. I'm burdened for the people in this room. I hope you're saved. And if you are saved, what is this series all about? Spreading the the gospel. Calvary as a church, let's not water it down. Listen to me this morning. It would be better that we have fewer true converts than pews full of people who die and go to hell. Let's not water down the message. Let's preach and proclaim and live the true good news of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, by your grace, Lord, protect us. Lord, there are so many ministries that have neglected repentance, neglected your word, neglected who Christ truly is, neglected so many things that are foundational. Lord, help us to stay true to the gospel, whether it's popular or it's not. Lord, help us to love people enough to tell them the truth. 
that they need you. They need to humble themselves. Or they'll stand in judgment and wrath. Lord, help us to be faithful. Lord, I pray if there's somebody in this room who's not truly saved, Lord, prick their heart right now. Prick their heart that they're not truly saved. Help them to come speak with me after the service. Speak with the deacon. Speak with my wife. Make sure they know for sure that they're reconciled with you, that they're forgiven, that they're saved. Lord, thank you for your word. Do a work this morning, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. With every head bowed.